Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue this series of videos in our group reading of Jacques Ellul's classic book, The Technological Society. In this third video, we will move on to consider the third chapter of the book dedicated to economic technique. Now, you might recall that Ellul had closed the second chapter by curiously describing the economy as the digestive system of technology. Well, in this chapter, we will find out exactly why he chose such a strange way to describe it. We'll begin first with the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. The purpose of this video is neither to promote nor to refute any theories, but rather to examine them from a strictly philosophical perspective. Also, this is a part of the School of Urban Text. Remember, you can join us there too for the extremely low price of just $2 per month. Links to both my Patreon and subscribe to our accounts in the video description. Also, if you find this discussion interesting, you may want to check out my upcoming book, The Jacquelot and the Technological Society, a reader's guide in which we continue the in-depth discussion we have been having of this text here on YouTube, but with a lot more added in, such as connections to other anti-technological thinkers like Ted Kaczynski, John Michael Greer, Pento Linklaw, etc., as well as connections to Jacques Ellul's many other writings. Ellul noted, as we will see in this video, in the 1980s explicitly, that um, his negative critique of technology was never meant to be read in isolation. You always had to consider that in the broader context of his also positive vision of what the future could look like in his theological writings. So we'll try to restore that connection in this book, but also in the upcoming series of videos where we consider those other works by Jacques Ellul here on YouTube. Now, as we get back into the text itself, um, Jacques Ellul opens this chapter, which is once again dedicated to the topic of economic technique, by acknowledging from the start that it will probably seem hopelessly naive to attempt to treat a subject as vast as the science of economics in the few pages which are allotted to a chapter within a book which is really about another topic altogether. This book is about technology or technique, but it's still going to try to deal with the um, supposedly rigorous science of economics. But um, a little cautions the from the start that his treatment of economic technique is going to be very different from either of the two standard approaches which already have a lot of work done within them. Not coincidentally, these other two approaches, which Jacques Ellul will not use, largely overlap with the traditional philosophical distinction between empiricism and rationalism, which are themselves inadequate to the task of describing the sort of thing that modern technology is. So first of all, Jacques Ellul will not follow the path of simply focusing on facts, if by facts you mean mere empirical statistics. The reason why Jacques Ellul did not feel any need to just jump on the bandwagon of focusing on more economic data was that there was no shortage of people already doing exactly the same thing. There would already been a huge mountain of economic data that had been gathered up by the time he wrote this book. And of course, ever more data are always being added up to that heap by the kind of specialists who understand that applying the scientific method is the best way, according to them, to generate wealth or prosperity on an economic level for their nations. On the other hand, it warns us from the start that he's also not going to follow the path of analyzing economics merely from the standpoint of formal logic, if by that you mean making general deductions in order to arrive at some conclusion, which admittedly follows from the premises, but only on an a priori level. The problem with this is that sticking too close to the a priori actively excuses one from feeling any need to cross-reference this logically derived conclusion with something else beyond it, which is called um, reality. Well, Elul rejects both of these approaches in his own study of economic technique because neither numerically increasing the number of economic data or statistics at our disposal, nor the purely abstract game of reasoning from a set of premises to a logically derived conclusion is going to be sufficient to give us an account of the kind of thing which really concerns us here. Because what really concerns us is a kind of technology which actually cannot be understood either through observing it on the naive surface level 
that wood tree technology is just one more physical object among all others, that's the empiricist path, nor through taking the rationalist path of using abstract human reasoning to try to judge how technology is going to act, or rather how it should act in accord with some eternal or a priori laws, for that would assume that technology's behavior can be constrained by some transcendent structure of abstract law from a second remove away. Instead, Jacques Ellul tries to understand economic technique in particular as something which transcends the entire empiricist rationalist binary by ironically being more like each of these things are than they are themselves. Now, the reasons mentioned in the first two chapters of this book, modern technology is in one sense more rational than empirical because modern technology is not just a bundle of so many physical machines which, to the naked eye, seem to exist independently of one another. Instead, technology for it is more like the systematic organization of those machines than it is the machines themselves. The irony noted all the way back in the first chapter of this book was that before any one physical machine can appear within the system of modern technology, the position which it filled in had to have already existed but on a purely abstract level. A machine can only come to fruition within that particular place if the system had created a particular niche for it within a pseudo-ecosystem of so many purely rationalized needs. A brute empirical observation of any one of those machines is therefore always merely secondary to the much more subtle way that technology had to have invisibly and even imperceptibly generated the need for that machine to exist through revolutionizing its own presuppositions in a purely abstract manner. At the same time, however, modern technology is also more empirical than rational, because modern technology's self-development never has to obey any eternal or a priori laws, because none of these can be powerful enough to govern the behavior of modern technology from some transcendent position lying beyond itself. This is because modern technology is always working, in fact, to destroy any established laws that had before constrained its behavior. It does away with old laws in order to actively generate new laws so that these will allow it to expand its capabilities to levels that would have seemed impossible just one technological generation earlier. And it does this through, in a certain sense, observing empirically what works better in the practical realm of ex execution, rather than get lost in the kind of idle speculation for its own sake, which technology has no use for. The only kind of minds which really are capable of wasting time on that activity are just human minds. The process of replacing old and outdated laws with things that are unquestionably better at doing the same thing is a process we know very well by another name. That's just a way of describing technological progress. Now, as we return to the text, we find that the real reason why Jacques Ellul shied away from both of these approaches is that neither one of them, neither empiricism nor rationalism, was capable of explaining how human freedom could exist. In fact, both of them had been used in the past to promote the pseudo-scientific thesis that freedom is an illusion. This actually is correct in its own way, for freedom is not the kind of thing which either an empiricist obsession with data and facts, nor a rationalist obsession with merely a priori reasoning could support the existence of. Neither of these approaches can lead you to discover human freedom, nor can it explain what sort of thing it is. The point of this analysis of economic technique will be to see whether human freedom still has any remaining place amidst the ensemble of impersonal technological factors which we know are hardwired to negate it over time. The question really is whether we're still there or whether we have already perhaps quietly disappeared from the equation. 
Well, needless to say, the most well-known theory regarding the relation between economy and technique is still the Marxist one. Once again, on page 153, Ilul admits that Marx was right in his description of technique, but only from the historical date of about 1830 onwards. Before then, the relation between economy and technology was rather different for the sort of reasons We've already explored in the first two chapters of this text. But the thing that really concerns us in the present chapter is that Marx, for all of his errors, actually did notice one thing that was correct about capitalism. is that the capitalist economy, for all of its grandeur, was fully dependent on something else, and that was technology. is because there is no such thing as modern industrial production without modern technology. The mistake which Marx made, however, was that of too strictly separating production from distribution and overemphasizing the extent to which only one of them had such a dependency on technology. For Marx, technology's role in the economy is largely synonymous with his notion of economic production, but this account is unsatisfactory because even at the time Jacques Ellul wrote this text, technique concerned itself with far more than just the positive production of goods, especially to satisfy human desires or needs. The atom bomb is a great example of this, because this is a weapon of mass destruction which has nothing to do with positively producing any consumeristic goods, nor even anything to do with increasing a person's financial wealth. But the atom bomb still appeared at a predetermined point within history because it was an inevitable outcome of pushing technological advancement one step further. Technologies whose sole purpose is destruction, even on a scale so massive as to call into question the very possibility of life on Earth, are not mistakes, but are instead even more faithful representatives of technique's inner workings than any consumer's products are. This is because modern technology is not constrained by any need to make us mere humans more wealthy, more prosperous, more happy, or even to keep us all from dying. In contrast with Marx's overemphasis on production, Jacques Ellul notes that distribution also makes use of many techniques without, however, producing anything, at least not in the traditional sense of the term. This is because technique's goal is always to increase control, predictability, efficiency, etc., and to do so for their own sakes. These are the factors which can be applied far beyond the much narrower scope of production, which Marx's um, obsession with capitalism rather than technology remains enslaved to. If you look closely at the current problems with the global supply chain, resulting in chronic shortages and an ever poor quality of products at ever higher prices, you'll realize that the technology of distribution only ever incidentally overlapped with human-centered goals like giving us what we desire. In the long term, this technology is proving itself to be driven by other motives. Beyond Marx, Ill notes that more recent economists have also misunderstood the relation between economy and technology and have done so just as badly. This is largely through seeing technology simply as a means to an end to further economic production rather than the other way around. In contrast, Jacques Ellul interprets the relation between these two factors as follows. Technique does indeed currently favor economic production, but this is not because it has any pathological desires related to human vices like consumerism or greed. Instead, technique currently favors economic production only because this helps make the system as a whole more interconnected, more regulated, more efficient, and more predictable. The case of agricultural production is particularly important for demonstrating how we usually get this relation exactly backwards. While it might seem to be the case that modern technology is used in agriculture only because it serves the human-centered goal of feeding more people with less labor, any short-term benefits in terms of lower food prices or higher yields 
are easily negated by the long-term damage which is caused by modern agricultural practices. Elul went as far as to warn that the kind of agricultural techniques that were being used to artificially maximize production would result in a level of ecological destruction, which he called a quote-unquote danger to the earth itself on page 151. Technique's interest in penetrating into the agricultural sector is all too easily misunderstood because technology does not seek to increase food production merely in order to satisfy human consumers better, let alone to rise up to the ethical challenge of solving the problem of world hunger once and for all. No, for technique, cracking this nut had far more to do with solving the properly technical problem that peasants had always been the least technology-prone sector of society. As you might recall that Jacques Ellul also noted in his book on propaganda, that peasants had traditionally been the most difficult group of people to influence with technologies like advertisement and mass media. As Ellul noted in the third chapter of this book, The Technological Society, quote-unquote, for a long time, peasant tradition resisted innovation, and the old agricultural systems preserved their stability. Today, technical transformation is an established fact. The peasant revolution is in process or already completed and elsewhere, uh, everywhere in the same direction. In other words, the peasants were only able to remain so indifferent to technological progress for so long because the agri agricultural system which they lived and worked in was itself still stuck in the past in the sense of being more or less independent of modern technologies that were being used in other industries. Peasants could still rely for a very long time on things like outdated tools and the kind of methods that had been used for generations before them to grow food. One way that the peasant who was before indifferent to technologies of control was finally overcome by technique was through being made fully conscious of the utter inferiority of his ways of growing food compared to the modernized industrial approaches which were wielded by technique. This was not just a question of aesthetic taste or style, by the way, which might still leave some room for debate. Instead, this concerned incontrovertible raw numbers which spoke for themselves. To take an example close to home for the West, whereas a traditional corn farmer in, say, Mexico might be able to grow some 20 bushels of corn per acre, an American agro-business operation in the Midwest could easily produce 200 bushels of corn per acre, but it could only do so through abusing the technologies of fossil fuel-based fertilizers, pesticides, GMOs, etc., once again, any economic production of goods and services, which we happen to find useful, is always revealed to be a mere secondary side effect of the deeper goal of maximizing technological control for its own sake, rather than the other way around. Another great example of this ironic reversal of expectations can be found in Elul's interpretation of automation. The revolution in automation cannot be explained solely in economic terms because, in many ways, this investment into so many machines was itself uneconomical, at least from the standpoint of the human owners of businesses, which was why some industrialists actually went against Technique's wishes by stubbornly refusing to update their old machinery simply because they didn't want to pay for it, as Elul noted in the second chapter of this book. Well, now in the third chapter, Elul also observes that some of these new machines actually are not worth their trouble in terms of how much they cost, how much waste they produce, compared to human labor. Because they never proved beneficial enough to cover the costs required to implement them, they actually represent a net loss to the businesses which have to use them. But that was not the point, for the real purpose of introducing these new machines into the system was never to make more money for any human person. It was instead to serve Technique's own interests of increasing control, even if it blatantly contradicts the economic interests of making money or reducing waste. In the section titled Economic Consequences, Elul reminds us that, once again, technique is not equivalent to the machine, 
as we see him directly saying on page 153. This is for all of the reasons that were already brought up in our readings of the first and second chapter. At this point of the text, however, Elul admits that the introduction of so many new machines into the economy is a problem which deserves a serious answer, even if we already understand how this distinction between technique and machine works. Now, from the naive standpoint, more automation was necessarily supposed to result in more leisure and more comfort for the human consumer, on grounds that the work which a person would have had to have spent time and energy doing before could now be done by the machines instead. However, it should be even more clear to us today that the formula more machines equals more comfort has never managed to materialize in reality. Instead, the historical anomaly of introducing so many more machines into the economy has created problems of its own, which even the top-down regulations of communist societies like the Soviet Union have been powerless to control. This is for all the reasons which Ted Kaczynski made clear in the first chapter of Anti-Tech Revolution Why and How, which you may recall was dedicated to the topic of why the development of a society can never be steered in any clear-cut direction by a human, no matter how wealthy or powerful that person might seem to be. Well, Jacques Ellul explains in this text, once again, that the introduction of so many machines cannot be explained in economic terms, because this level of investment is actually, ironically, quite uneconomical. No matter how much money is invested into these machines, they always require more investment, because a machine is actually not a static object which ever reaches a final state. Instead, these machines, by their very nature, are constantly growing. They grow not only in size, but also in cost. In addition, they require frequent updates before having to be replaced altogether by improved models that fundamentally devalue their predecessors into that state of absolute worthlessness, which we call technological obsolescence. In addition, these machines have the effect on human labor of generating large systems of workers which require additional specialists to oversee and regulate them, which means more cost to the business owner who must ultimately borrow the money from some financial institution just to avoid bankruptcy for a little longer. Finally, Ilul mentions that publicity techniques come to develop, which in turn enable a massive psychological propaganda program to turn humans into fully manipulable electrical appliances, which can be artificially stimulated into any predictable reaction which happens to be desired by the system. A strange irony of spending so much time surrounded by machines while you're at work is that even the human workers will themselves become the kinds of machines whose buttons can be easily pushed by anyone who has access to the blueprints telling them where the buttons are located. While this is an arrangement certainly is beneficial to the global technological system that only cares about maximizing control for its own sake, it still does represent a huge loss for the human business owners who have to foot the bill for all of it. In fact, because of the uneconomical and non-productive nature of this investment, it quickly becomes a game that human individuals actually cannot participate in. Instead, economic activity eventually becomes a privilege of massive globalist corporations before becoming a monopoly which is nationalized by the state itself. This concentration of power into the hands of the few really cannot be avoided because technique itself requires a concentration of capital beyond anything which human individuals could ever hope to participate in. In the early years of the Cold War, Elul warned that any further development in technology would inevitably lead either to the American model of the corporation or the Soviet model of the state. Both of these, however, negate any chance for personal freedom. As a result, in both of these systems, workers are required to behave more and more like machines while they're on the clock, but cannot ex- escape that fate even after leaving work. Even the consumers who seek to enjoy the benefits of their pay really are not free during their time off, because the only other activity besides work which they can engage in is consumption. 
Consumption, however, isn't really a free activity because it can't just happen spontaneously. Consumption is always determined beforehand by a technology of propaganda which artificially induces you to desire only those same commodities or manufactured experiences which the industrial production apparatus had already decided that it was going to sell you. Advertisement is just a way for the system to let you know what you're supposed to want, in which case it isn't really a desire at all because you didn't have a choice in the matter. Once again, this concentration of capital cannot be explained in purely economic terms, for this has actually tended to result in lower rather than higher profits. Shifting the emphasis from economics to technology, however, shows that the point was never to make more money to satisfy human pathologies like greed. Instead, the point all along was just to accommodate technique's tendency to produce upgrades, which allow it to grow larger in size with every leap, to the point that eventually, only organizations as massive as the state itself can actually afford to implement them. In fact, this need for organizations to grow to monopolistic scopes of operation is so hardwired an outcome of further technological development that this takes place even when the state explicitly tries to stop it from happening. You could just consider the USA's laws which formally forbid monopolies from existing, but which somehow fail to do anything to stop the monopolies of Silicon Valley from growing to globe-spanning proportions. Elul is very careful to note, however, that this is not at all to say that the state has any tendency to lose power as technique progresses. On the contrary, the two necessarily grow together because both of them represent a decline in the freedom of the individual. To cite Elul's own example, corporations are not fully independent of the need for massive state power because they too require things like a functional electric grid to span the kind of geographic scopes which can only be maintained by the state. But beyond this immediately pragmatic need for, say, electric power, the state is also favored by technique because it serves the purified interest of breaking down local powers and subsuming all of them into a larger collective, which will ultimately lead beyond any nation's borders to a single globalist unity. Only with this consideration in mind can we now understand the real reason why atomic energy, for all of its problems, is favored by technique as the next leap forward. This is not because nuclear energy actually promises the human consumer a lifetime of limitless or too cheap to meter energy as was quite literally being promised at the time that Elul wrote this book. Instead, atomic energy is favored because it would require an even greater concentration of power into the hands of the state, along with an even greater breakdown of local structures in favor of a unity that eventually leads to a one-world government. The reason why the state must take control of nuclear energy is that the technical challenge of running a nuclear power plant is so gargantuan that no human individual could actually hope to personally oversee this on their own terms. In contrast, in pre-modern economic arrangements, individuals really did have power to oversee their own operations. You can just think of the way that every village, even up to the early 20th century in the rural parts of the United States, had a local blacksmith who could oversee all of the operations going on in his own little shops. Well, in Lul's words on page 157, it is not doctrinal, but rather technical reasons which today render economic life inseparable from the state. The total irrelevance of economic doctrine has been confirmed, in fact, by the way that the very science of economics has undergone a noticeable change with the rise of modern technique. If you think about it, very old economics texts used to understand economics to be the science of wealth, which presupposed the private individual as its topic of discussion. These texts were more like philosophy books which anybody could read. In contrast, modern economics is a rigorous science which is obsessed with pure mathematical formalization, 
resulting in texts which even specialists can't really understand because they're largely written in mathematical symbols and formulae. No longer is the individual's pursuit of wealth the concern of the text, rather the technique of administration, which extends far beyond individual financial concerns to encompass everything within society, is the concern because everything is now fair game for regulation. This would only make sense, though, for the truth about modern economics is that its subject matter is no longer any individual's wealth, but instead the regulation of all of society for its own sake. In a section titled The Secret Way, we find, hence, the rise of a properly economic technique. Like other techniques, this one is simultaneously a matter of knowledge and action, or, as noted at the beginning of the text, something which is more rationalist than rationalism and more empirical than empiricism. It would be a mistake, however, to view this economic technique as something like a tool in the service of any humans, something that they could use to get whatever they want. Instead, as Elul says himself on page 159, quote unquote, it behaves rather with its own specific weight and direction. It is not a mere instrument, but possesses its own force, which urges it into determined paths, sometimes contrary to human wishes. Economists fail to realize this by making the error of thinking that economic technique is something which can be denutralized and then put to use to serve their own pathological human interest. Economic techniques neutrality, as Ulul calls it, though, means that it is a fully impersonal force that always develops itself autonomously, without any need to be steered by any human, nor, in fact, is the latter even possible. Now, the reason for this should be clear, if one recalls Jacques Ellul's thesis from the beginning of the second chapter, that modern technique became modern precisely when it reached the point of no longer being a mere intermediary between a person and its milieu. That had been the case for the traditional techniques going all the way back to the prehistoric hunter-gatherer times. But modern technique became modern precisely when it broke off to become a fully objective force in its own right. Only then was it able to take on substance and transmit it itself to any new location around the world. But even if this much is clear from reading the second chapter, we now must ask, what was the reason for the rise of economic technique in the first place? Well, in a certain sense, economics simply followed the trend for all sciences to model themselves after physics by striving for full mathematical formalization, as well as striving to dissolve any pre-given dogmatic presuppositions in favor of exact and unambiguous procedures. Economics differs from the other sciences, though, in that it is under far more pressure to make credible predictions about the future, because the predictions made by economists do not exist in a vacuum of idle speculation, but are instead taken very seriously by people who stake a lot of their own personal money on the professional advice about where the market is heading. Economists are wrong so often in their predictions about the market, though, that Six Hex and Hammer 666 once joked that you can know what's really going to happen simply through reversing whatever Krugman published in the New York Times. Worse still, different economists provide different explanations about why what happened did happen after the fact, and these explanations by so-called experts flatly contradict one another in their analysis of exactly the same thing. For all these reasons, economists have been under ever more pressure to try to develop techniques which could override the distorting biases of mere human opinion in order to stick so closely to the facts as to follow the trend of the market wherever it had already been predetermined to lead itself. But any leaps in greater formalization also followed necessarily from the simple fact that the facts themselves grew far more complex as history progressed. 18th century e economics books described a phenomenon which anyone could understand because the theory painted an image which more or less directly corresponded to one's intuitive experience of the world. Today, however, the economic models are so fully mathematicized 
that they really don't correspond to anyone's intuitive experience of anything, because the scope has extended so far beyond the local that only the unrepresentable global scope of a model can really be their subject matter. The other factor which changed traditional economics into modern economics was the old David Humean distinction between what is and what should be. Now, of course, any good empiricist knows that one of these sides can never lead to the other. In other words, there is no way to deduce an ethical or moral imperative saying what you should do from having an empirical observation of what already is the case. Any real science, quote-unquote, then, can only make progress through dissolving any remaining dogmatic presuppositions it might have had, especially regarding ethics, morality, and other prescriptive um, types of pseudo-knowledge in favor of an ever more neutral recording of the facts as they objectively are. While such a goal might seem noble in and of itself, the real reason, it will tells us, why this is favored by the technological system is that it happens to overlap with technology's own disregard for any question of ethics, for the reason that no transcendent system of absolute moral values ever could hope to constrain technique's self-development, because that would require technology to compare itself with some hypothetical image of how things should be. Morality and technology, then, simply cannot coexist with one another in the long run. The one will have to destroy the other. In addition, because of technique's hardwired tendency to always pursue the largest possible scope of operation, even though microeconomics and macroeconomics are still thought of as independent sciences, there is a hardwired trend for microeconomics to eventually be nothing more than a deduction from the realer science of macroeconomics. Finally, modern economics' goal of mathematical formalization also coincides nicely with its need to serve the unspeakable goal of excluding the common man from a closed circle of elites and specialists who needlessly fall back on using linguistic encryption even when they describe obvious or common sense observations. This problem is not unique, however, to economics, for, as Elul says himself on page 162, technique as a general phenomenon always gives rise to an aristocracy of technicians who guard secrets to which no outsider has access. This hardwired need to exclude the masses actually does mean that technique is hardwired to eventually make democracy obsolete. As Elul noted on page 162, quote unquote, economic life, not in its content, but in its direction, will henceforth entirely elude popular control. No democracy is possible in the face of a perfected economic technique. Anyone who objects that it just can't be so, or that a technological society must, by its very nature, be a democratic society, because both of these values seem to represent a modernized enlightenment over the ignorance of the past, misses the point that technology's long-term negation of democracy cannot be blamed on malice or any other human pathology on the part of the system. The system does not oppose democratic freedom because it is evil. It opposes democratic freedom because the progress of modern technology is something that is simply far too important to be entrusted to the whims of voters. Voters' decisions are too incoherent, too poorly informed, and too unreliable even under the best of conditions. But as time goes on, Conditions drift further and further away from the best because technique has a perverse incentive to make people less and less capable of thinking as time goes on. Democracy might serve an important symbolic function to make people feel like freedom is still possible, but even when Elul wrote this text in the mid-20th century, all of the real decisions of the system were already being regulated by technology or purified technique itself. If even politicians and world leaders were at that time mere symbolic figureheads with no real power, 
How much more irrelevant were the opinions of ordinary voters, even those who had fallen for the delusion of thinking that they, of all people, could rule themselves through casting a vote once every four years? In a section titled The Economic Techniques of Observation, it will notes that economics as practiced today directly involves various techniques of observation such as statistics and modeling, both of which presuppose a general tendency towards ever greater mathematical formalization. The contemporary reader of Elul might be surprised to learn that there actually was a time when doubt was placed on the credibility of these stats. But today they're simply taken for granted as so obviously infallible that it's not possible to debate it. Jacques Lille notes, though, that the real reason for such a reversal of opinion was not that the economic statisticians succeeded in convincing the world that they were right through, say, actually being correct in their predictions. But we know that wasn't the case. It was instead that the world itself changed into one of mathematical statistics itself. So the validity of a derived science of economics modeled on such a foundation was easily taken for granted as being true. This overemphasis on economic stats also fit the general trend of history, because over time, it is less and less a matter of any operation performed by a human mind. Instead, advances in AI had already allowed more impressive operations to be performed by electric brains than human ones, even at the time Jacques Ellul wrote this text, which you'll bear in mind was in the 1950s, long before the rise of chat GPT. Now, popular opinion would hold that the value of statistics lies in its ability to help one make predictions about the future. If this is done correctly, this will um, create a kind of knowledge which can be sold for a very high price to some corporation on grounds that this secret knowledge will allow them to get ahead of where the market is already going so that they can make even more money. Jacques Lille warns us, though, that the science of precise statistical data generation is not just about making huge macroeconomic predictions, um, which uh, would seem to be, by their very nature, irrelevant to the production operations going on at one local factory. Instead, the latter cannot produce anything unless it too makes use of these same statistical science methods. This is because the production of just one hypothetical item might require one to take into account exact measurements of hundreds of other factors. Exact measurements of quantity, time, etc. are necessary for the production of what seems to the naked eye to be one isolated and independent product, because nothing is really isolated or independent anymore. We only ever seem to exist in a world of static and separate objects. In reality, we're always immersed in an interconnected, globe-spanning system. The mathematical construct, which actually does succeed in fitting these hundreds of factors together in a meaningful way, which could allow one to theoretically make good predictions for the future, is of course called a model, which is why the model takes on a central position in the application of economic science in the real world. Jacques Ellul was very careful to mention, though, that a model must not be thought of as anything like a picture especially not a picture of anything in the naive sense of the term. A model is instead a set of equations reflecting variables and constants which are at work in the economic relations in which some given product is caught up. A model is based on equations rather than pictorial representations because equations can be solved, whereas a picture cannot. Solving the equation in this case means making correct predictions in order to maximize profit and defeat one's competitors. And this will conclude the first of two videos on the third chapter, which is particularly long and dense. The second video will follow in just a few days.